Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I'm Francis Seeley from Enfield Climate Action Forum and Global Net 21, and this is one of the many webinars we do that looks at a whole series of different issues. And today we've got Paul Turner with us. Now, Paul is from what is called the Ministry of Eco-Education, and we're going to talk to him about that. And basically, it's about how you approach climate change in schools. Now, we've done this before, but there are lots of innovations going on, which is really, really quite exciting. And the Ministry of Eco-Education Eco is one of those. So we're going to talk to Paul about it. So thank you. Thank you, Paul, thank you. for joining us today. And maybe I can ask you to start with, if you could tell us very briefly something about yourself and your background. OK, well, yeah, no, hello and, and uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, so my name is Paul and I was a secondary geography teacher uh, and have been or had been for sort of 15, 20 years. Um, and towards the end of my uh, kind of time in this school, I'd created a series of lessons around climate breakdown and shared those publicly. And um, they sort of built a bit of momentum and, and uh, people around the world were sort of accessing those. And then um, Ecotricity were looking for someone to uh, lead on an educational project, helping to sort of um, create a sense of urgency and build momentum around uh, kind of education, uh, around the climate and nature crisis, particularly with the role of supporting teachers. So the focus of what they wanted to do was to support teachers. And so, yeah, now I'm I'm the education lead for this project, the Ministry of Eco-Education, and we've been running for maybe a year, year and a half now. Um, OK, well, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. But, but I saw you described as a not just a geographer, yes. but as a radical geographer. What does that mean? So... Um, I'm particularly keen to encourage critical thought. And so that aspect of radical geography is about uh, engaging young people with the world around them through a critical lens and getting them to explore and, and kind of understand and, and question the way the world is structured with the purpose of sort of creating a happier and healthier world for everyone. So it's it's sort of challenging the status quo. OK, so you challenge the status quo and you're now doing that in the Ministry of Eco-Education. Now, that's a pretty impressive name. Maybe you could tell us again briefly because we'll go through it as we talk, you know, what that is and why that name was chosen. So it's it's purposefully tongue in cheek. Uh, and this comes back to the project uh, is funded through Ecotricity and Dale Vince is the founder of Ecotricity and he's got a particular um, kind of view on the world and how he thinks the world should be. And one of the things he's very critical of is that the sense that the government are not doing enough, and particularly within this educational space. So the, the name was chosen. The name wasn't chosen by myself, but it was it was chosen by people leading on the project, decided the Ministry of Eco-Education being that tongue-in-cheek idea of saying, look, the government are not doing enough. We're going to just make up our own and we'll show them how things can be and what, what we can do. Yeah, I feel like I'm going to have to say to you now, yes, Minister, um, but anyhow, <laughs> you, you, you've got the name and that's great. How did it all start? I mean, I gather it started in a school in Stroud. Could you tell yes. us how it started? Yeah, because ultimately the whole project started with a conversation between Nick Moss, who's the head teacher of a school in Minchinhampton, a primary school, and Dale Vince. And Nick was saying, look, we want to do more as a school, but we don't have the resource and the means. You know, we've got the um, the sort of will, but we haven't got the ability to actually make it happen. So Dale said, look, we'll get someone on board. We'll, we'll, we'll scale this project. Also with an idea of saying look, what we do at Minchinhampton, we can then share and spread around the country. So the project started started yes with the with the sort of enthusiasm of a lot of the teachers at Minchin Hampton School over in Stroud and then we've spent the last year working with 15 schools across the country and those 15 um, primary schools we called them pioneer schools were from a whole um, sort of uh, spread of, of demographic, uh, kind of geographical spread. Um, and, and the purpose of that was to do a bit of a controlled trial and to really explore the impact of the work that we were doing. Um, but kind of since then, we've been sharing the project more and more, and we've got more than 150 schools now engaged. And we're particularly this year shifting our focus from primary and translating it to key stage three into secondary schools. OK, so, so that, that, that's what it is. Um, and it's about greening the curriculum. Um, but what's the purpose? I mean, is it because you believe that uh, climate change is not taught adequately in schools or that teachers actually are at a bit of a, a loss and they need help? 
there's two strands there is the what's happening in the world around us in the sense of the the warming that we're experiencing and also then the impact that has on society um so it's a response in, in terms of that, particularly around the urgency of how long we actually have. You know, there are lots of UN reports which sort of outline, you know, do, do we have maybe a decade at the very most? So there's a real sense of urgency of needing to do as much as we can within every single sphere. And then the, the other sort of aspect of this is to say young people are really asking for this. This is something that young people are demanding. And there's a whole variety of campaigns that sort of illustrate that. There's the Teach the Future campaign in the UK. There's lots of these um, Fridays for Future, the kind of youth global strike sort of um, that, that also just display that momentum and desire from young people. And so, yes, what we're saying is um, we're here to help support schools to do as much as they can within the current framework and within particularly within the UK then that's uh, adhering to the kind of national curriculum and what we're trying to show or we are showing is that you can teach the national curriculum through an environmental lens and it's something that's achievable for schools right away it's not something that we need to wait for big government top-down change okay so so you want to help schools uh, but how do you find out what schools actually need? I mean, you have what I think is called an inquiry approach. I mean, what is that? So very early on, before we did anything with the project, we carried out lots of research. And partly that was through lots of networks that already exist. There's some really good um, networks of teachers, um, uh, sort of on the forefront, I guess, of this, of, of kind of really uh, people with great enthusiasm. But it was it was through those sorts of networks we looked then at what the actual picture is in schools and what's currently happening. And the reality is that a lot of environmental education, though it's been happening for decades, and, and it's quite common now, particularly for primary schools, to have forest schools, that the 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 depth and um the reality of of this within schools is often quite stark and and there's not actually that much happening often it's a single teacher who takes sole responsibility and also it's often the periphery both in terms of the school day so it's a small club or it's the periphery of the school space it's, it's a garden space tucked around the corner and and so what we are saying is that this is something that it needs to be every single person's responsibility, every teacher, every member of staff. And, and also then it's something that everyone can embed across their subject. So we're kind of illustrating how this can be done in a very cross curricular way. And it's something that teachers can pepper throughout their whole um, curriculum and, and through all their lessons rather than relying on one person. I I mean, that's interesting you say that because I talked to quite a few people on this and they sort of share that view that lots of schools think that if they have a teacher that's in charge of climate change, right, they've done their bit. But they're saying what you said, that climate change impacts on geography, history, religion, literature, even everything, sport. Um, and somehow you've got to embed climate change in every single subject. Um, and that is quite a radical thing to say. It's also an easy thing to say, but it's difficult to get a school to do it, if they, especially if they've got one teacher. How do you do that? Clearly, that's your mission. Yeah. But how do you do that? So what we have created over the last year is a five step journey that takes schools uh, from where they are now. They carry out some surveys and consultations and consult the whole school community. So this is something that we say in order for it to be truly sustainable, it needs to be every person within the school community who's involved from the very beginning. Um, and so we've we've pulled together resources to help support that. The thing I should say as well is we, we're not an organisation who has created some amazing new resources and that every teacher should be teaching. What we've done is simply pulled together all of the free materials that already exist. And the thing that we've done is weaved them together into series of lessons that are mapped against the national curriculum. So what we're trying to do is help amplify it and um, support and let people know about all of the great things that are happening by putting it into a sort of logical framework. And so in terms of this five-step journey, the second step then is uh, some materials to help schools map their curriculum and explore where sustainability currently sits. And I think 
every time I've experienced this in schools, they're often surprised by how much they are already doing. The problem is it's often um, um, sort of it's kept within a certain department or it's not shared and people don't realise it's happening. And it, and it could be in English looking at um, speeches from Greta Thunberg and looking at the, the language and the techniques that she uses. Um, it might be you know, other kind of more common ones that you might think of. But even in languages, they will often have uh, climate change as a context that they'll then be ex exploring. But we've then got the, the resources to help map that. And then that's a starting point to say, OK, what of the resources and materials that we've pulled together can schools easily connect and embed within their curriculum? And then the next step is then looking at their school site, mapping the school site, thinking, how can we embed the school site within as a learning resource for subjects? So that actually, by teaching lessons, we're helping to look after spaces and help develop the biodiversity of, of the school site as part of the curriculum, rather than it being someone else's responsibility, maybe outside of lesson time. And there's that whole journey which takes them through actually having a go practicing and using some of the resources and building their confidence. And ultimately, we want schools to be able to use our, our database of all of these resources. We've got more than 160 different organizations, resources pulled together. Uh, and our kind of framework and approach that schools can then start to build their own inquiry questions and topics. I was going to ask you how you involve the whole community, but you've partly answered that by talking about social mapping in the school. Um, the trouble with social mapping is it can be a fairly sort of, you know, latent, non-active exercise. You just put points on a map where things are. And many people say to make social mapping work it's got to be proactive you've got to network within the social map itself how do you do that how do you i mean you can get the community involved you can social map it but how do you get every part of it to interact with each other yeah there's i guess a whole variety of things so one of the surveys we use early on is called the nature connection index to score um, everyone from the students parents governors all of the school staff their relationship with the rest of nature and that gives you a value a score between zero and 100 and that's like a starting point that we then use to to build on um what we've also got though are, are things like um lessons for parents where the school can then bring in the the, the parents and the students can host um, lessons for them but also I guess at the heart of all of these inquiry questions each of these topics there's a series of eight lessons and what the students are working towards the piece of work um, that they're kind of invested in is something that has a real world value and we're trying to encourage schools to ensure that the students are working towards creating something that has meaning beyond the classroom or the, the teacher. And some of those are events. So the idea that the school would host people from the local community. Uh, some of them are the students producing a video or a podcast or, or some sort of written material that can be then shared, particularly maybe even through networks, you know, like the ones that you're part of yourself. So we're sort of um, making those connections and embedding um, kind of things that already exist within the community. And, and partly this is all about making sure that schools are uh, a catalyst within their local community, because it's the scale schools are at that means we can quite rapidly reach audiences uh, well beyond just the young people who are in the school you know they're each part of a family they're all connected and if we can through the learning enable more interaction that can really help uh, the pace of change yeah i was going to ask you how you involve the community outside the school including the parents as well i mean in ncap we just run a, a sort of planet um competition with primary schools when mm. we got a university to make a couple of videos, one for primary, one for secondary. We've taken it into something like 20 schools and asked the students to either write a poem, write an article, make a video, do whatever. And um, they then entered the competition. And last week we had a prize and a huge number of people, parents and community people turned up. Is that the sort of thing you do in order to network the social map that you've created? Yeah, definitely that. And I think uh, what the reality is, there are schools doing this, you know, just as you've described, there are places already doing this. What we all we want to do is help ensure that this becomes mainstream so that every school does this and everyone knows about this. So it is sort of, uh, you know, I can imagine that actually um, finding out more about what you've just described would be really useful as something we can then help translate and make sure other schools and other communities are doing as well. Well, that would be very happy to, to do with you. Mm. 
Tell us a bit more about the inquiry approach and how you then translate that into a lesson plan. And maybe you could do that by one simple example. Yeah, definitely. So in education, there's some interesting debates happening, particularly around ideas of maybe powerful knowledge. Um, And I think, I mean, it's a slightly um, kind of overstated dichotomy, but there's this sense of there's there are more progressive uh, groups of teachers and, and educators and more traditional educators and I think we place ourselves a little bit further along in terms of the progressive um, spectrum and that's partly that this inquiry approach is part of that what we're saying is there isn't um, a set um, sort of knowledge that young people need to learn you know we can't prescribe the sorts of things that we want people to know about the climate and nature crisis it's more about asking questions and encouraging an inquisitive nature and exploring young people's responses and thoughts that is key and so through this inquiry approach we've got questions like um, should we all be vegan and it might be that people straight away think oh it's some sort of prescriptive um idea of encouraging everyone to become a vegan but instead no it's it's about a critical um, sort of journey understanding actually if everyone became vegan what would that mean for the world in terms of land management land use what would happen to people who are employed in uh, farming so um, these series of eight lessons kind of explores what we mean by veganism because obviously as well it's actually much broader than just food it's actually it's also to do with the relationship with the rest of nature and understanding um what we think of nature in terms of uh, as a resource or, or or something that we're part of and that's something that we kind of explore through the the series of lessons yeah got... I, saw, I saw on your site you've got a bit about should we go vegan yeah um which helps people but I mean, if you have this inquiry approach, it must be ongoing. And that means your lesson plans can't be static. They have to change as the inquiries come in. Yeah. How how do you program that in so you're continuously improving your lesson plan? Well, so what we have are each lesson has a different question. So we have these overarching questions. So, you know, a good example is that should we all go vegan? And then the reality is that underneath that question, we've actually got a whole variety. Uh, I'm just going to find a few of them. Um, you know, yeah, we've got this idea of what it means to be vegan. Um, that each lesson has a... Um, a different question and then within those lessons what we have done is we've curated we've pulled together maybe five or six different resources that teachers can choose from so the idea is we've almost created a menu of these third-party resources that teachers can pick and choose from and then it's up to them to have the flexibility to sort of pull that into their lesson i guess that inquiry approach um sort of sits Yes, across these series of lessons, but they're kind of self-contained lessons. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, when I I listen to you and I see your size and so on, and you're about obviously sustainability and making schools more green, and you're trying to influence uh, students, but in a way, um, you're giving confidence to teachers as well, aren't you? I mean, teachers very often want to teach, but the subjects are so huge, they often don't know where to start. And so it really is important, isn't it, to provide that help to teachers that gives them the confidence to teach the subject. Yeah, definitely. And that's what we saw with the research that we carried out. So with the 15 schools that we worked with last year, um, uh, the teachers, there was a 71% increase in teachers' confidence in terms of these topics around sustainability. But we also explored their sense of hope as well. So there was a 53% increase in their sense of hope. Um, so I, I think um, you're right in saying that that teachers, um, there's, a desire, there's a desire and enthusiasm to teach this, but they recognise themselves that there is a sort of lack or an uncertainty around, um, yeah, like you say, where to start, but also in terms of... Um, it kind of yeah what they can find to help them i think because that, that was one of the things that we noticed when we did our initial research was that that all of these this material exists but it's often hidden or buried in websites and as a teacher teachers don't have enough time or the kind of energy or the uh, knowledge necessarily to be able to go and access these so we very much wanted to save them that time save them the energy by pulling them all together into one place and adding value to it by weaving it together into series of lessons so you must spend a lot of your time on the web doing searches 
finding what exists uh, because all the material you've got is free, isn't it? Yeah, and I guess we were fortunate in that because we started um, with connections with Ecotricity, that they already have something called the Green Britain Partnership, which are a whole variety of organisations that they provide uh, electricity for. And so we use those as a starting point, and they include things like the RSPB and the, the WWF as well, and, and there's a whole variety of organisations that they're connected with. And then we've sort of built on from that. Um, we've been fortunate that we've, we've built some really good relationships with a lot of these organisations, and every time there's a new resource or something that they uh, think we might be interested in, they send over. Mm-hmm. We've also been really keen to ensure that the, the materials that we've created are quite... Um, kind of crowdsourced to an extent so we've asked people often is there a question you think that's that's missing is there anything we should add in um and it, you know that's also been a really key part of the process and, and i think that's something we're keen to continue to drive is that idea of co-creation and collaboration which i think is actually often missing from from this part of uh, you know education often teachers act within little kind of silos and, and quite isolated but equally a lot of these organizations aren't talking to each other so we're hoping to be a bit more of an umbrella for that. That's a collaborative approach, though, is very time consuming. I mean, have you got the staff? Have you got the backup? Have you got the volunteers to make that collaboration um, work? Well, in terms of the team at the Ministry of Eco Education, at the moment, it's very much myself. Um, so, I mean, I think we've done pretty well in terms of the last year. A lot of what we've created, though, is inspired by teachers. So we've re- we've relied on teachers being uh, really open to sharing what they've created. So we've got now more than uh, 400 lessons and 50 of these inquiry questions, which um, you know goes all the way from uh, the early years up now to key stage three. Um, and a lot of where we've started is is kind of being inspired by the questions or the resources that, that teachers have created themselves. And then often the, the journey in terms of adapting those to something that can then be shared more widely is thinking, OK, how can we um, supplement this and add in these other resources that that, that I know of? And, and you say, well, you've got 15 schools. So how many how many students do you well, think you would have uh, the, the you know, 15, approached? So the 15 schools was... Um, the trial that we carried out last year and finished last uh, in the summer. Um, and with that, though, we had about 45,000 students who were involved in lessons directly. Um, but over the last year, we were also sharing it more widely as well. We've got now almost 150 schools. So I, I would have thought now we're on to hundreds of thousands. What we have got is um, a commitment to 2025. And what we want is half of all schools in the country engaged with this sort of approach. Uh, and that's something that we are sort of committed to, to achieving. OK, but the schools you've got mainly are primary schools, aren't they? But you want to extend into secondary schools as well. Now, if you do that, that will mean a different approach, won't it? Yes. Yeah. And so the the new approach for Key Stage 3 is a shared inquiry question across two subjects. So to fit into the sort of curriculum timetabling and the way that secondary schools are structured and to ensure that we still achieve that cross curricular approach, what we've got are questions where two subjects teach from their perspective so it doesn't affect the timetabling, but it's a, it's a shared inquiry question. And what's interesting as well is um, whereas Lots of the primary resources are a bit more mechanical and sort of understanding the how things work and and, and um, uh, I guess a little bit more knowledge based. What's really interesting at the Keystone Tree level is the ability to ask more of the philosophical questions as well and to go into much more detail, uh, challenging young people on how the world's structured and asking questions of, of why is it like this and how could it be done differently. Well, I was going to ask you about that, how sort of how far you can sort of venture into the controversial, because once you get to secondary schools, you're with students who are highly motivated. They're quite happy to go on school strikes. They want to get engaged in protests. But local authorities don't particularly like you talking about that in schools. They want you to talk about litter picks and recycling and all these nice things that they think uh, is going to make the world a difference. But students are yeah. impatient. They want to do more. So. Are you able to teach, you know, climate protest, protests, for example, in the context of history, suffragettes and how things have moved on in terms of bottom up protest movements? Yeah, no, there are. And there's definitely lessons in there that put the 
direct action that we're seeing now in the context of that global picture. So in terms of the Department for Education's guidance on this, it's very much saying uh, teachers shouldn't advocate for a political perspective and they shouldn't advocate specific solutions. And so I think teachers um, need to sort of appreciate that and understand actually there is still lots of, of um, space to be able to explore what might be perceived as controversial issues. And I think it's important that teachers don't shy away from this. That's something that's been a really keen aspect of what we're trying to do is, is to encourage teachers to be slightly braver and bolder and give them the support in order to achieve that. And there's lots of other organisations working, um, doing very well in terms of that space as well, providing teachers with training so that they feel comfortable to explore these things. I think there's no no reason why any teachers can't ask questions. You can't encourage young people. There's no reason you can't get them asking the questions it's then that level of ag advocacy which is is um maybe the controversial bit but i mean how do you get teachers to feel confident because sometimes they're frightened to do that you know we'll do a lesson how do you throw paint on a, a, a really you know important and historic painting and suddenly you will get people complaining about that maybe parents maybe counselors i mean how do you give teachers the confidence to do that because it has to be said I mean this is part of of you know the total picture and if you if you don't address that you're not addressing what's happening at the moment so you've yeah. got to be really careful haven't you yeah in terms of the, our approach it's saying look there is this training available to you so we signpost to um, a whole variety of staff training some of it free some of it with some cost that would provide teachers with the opportunity to explore that in more detail and, and develop their skills but the other thing that we rely on as well is this idea that we're pulling resources from sort of trusted third party locations and the idea then that that's a really valuable resource that helps support teachers to do a good job in terms of exploring that the thing i, I was going to say as well actually is in terms of um very much our perspective is we're trying to encourage agency and action from young people and I guess we're trying to frame it within a very much um, a positive lens and show young people how they can have a positive impact within their local community and on the world and that often being a starting point to uh, I guess um, uh, deeper political engagement and political in a sense of sort of a small p being an active citizen and that's something we're really keen to encourage and, and lots of the activities and resources and questions really facilitate that of creating engaged participating citizens um, which I think we recognize as something that, that that can often kind of disappear in schools. I mean citizenship in schools is often taught in terms of you know conventional ways going out to vote etc but you actually talk about active citizenship which is a lot more than that is that right yeah and i know um some people might start from a kind of consumer base and saying you know as a, as a consumer there are choices you can make but what we're also saying is actually um within your local community there's so much that you can uh, engage with and support you know we've seen this with sort of mutual aid over the covid crisis um yeah, and I think what the other thing I was going to pick up on, actually, was also this idea of litter picking, that we've gone into so many primary schools in particular that are so fixated on that idea that litter picking is the, the, the most important thing in the world. And what we have been really keen to do is to say to schools, look, actually... Um, there's a sort of um, a spectrum of impact and actually you might actually be focusing too heavily on the things that have little to no difference and instead trying to shift their lens and, and a lot of the questions that we're encouraging schools to ask in these sort of um, series of lessons are about actually um, trying to focus on the things that have impact and the big questions and a lot of that is also then reflecting on the school community on the school itself and asking those sorts of questions about maybe how the school structure is structured in terms of discipline or um, asking questions about who's in charge and therefore where responsibility lies um, as well as things like energy and food and transport and, and other things that we could explore okay okay cool so i see you're not just a radical geographer you're quite radical in your approach as well look we're coming close to the end of our 30 minutes so how do you see your future i mean you say you want to reach something like ten thousand primary and secondary schools by 2025 that's quite an ambitious aim isn't it do you think you'll do it yeah no definitely so we're, we're fortunate that we've got a few um i guess sort of 
uh, networks and connections up our sleeve that we're hoping to rely on. We, in the next couple of weeks, are going to launch a new website, which will make it much easier for schools to sign up and access the resources. So in the coming weeks, it'll be much easier for schools to access all the materials and to track their progress as well through this journey. And what we've also got now is we've got really close relationships with things like eco schools, which has um uh, most schools about 80 percent probably even more are signed up to eco schools and so through their networks we're sort of sharing and disseminating news of what we're doing uh, we've also because of forest green rovers um we've got connections with the premier league and we've created some resources for community trusts so each football club around the country has a group of staff who have a responsibility to go into uh, local schools and support in the past it's often been english maths and and maybe a bit of science and pe but we've created resources for them to explore sustainability to explore a little bit about what their football club is doing what forest green rovers are doing but it's a way into the curriculum into the resources so that's another kind of avenue and then we've also I got a relationship with um, a, a company who provide food for schools, who provide sustainable food called the Devil's Kitchen. And again, through that network, we're hoping to be able to scale and 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 reach uh, a greater audience. I think what's um, we've really recognised over the last year as well, though, is that it's not a one size fits all, and that every school has a slightly different circumstance and situation. And we've been really uh, keen to to sort of engage with that and understand that schools have different priorities, but ultimately. I think everyone agrees we need to get to a, a, a happier, healthier, uh, I guess, state in terms of the world. And, and so how we might get about that might differ slightly for schools, but um, we can definitely support them in, in terms of achieving that goal. OK, so it is definitely ambitious. So if anybody wanted to find out about you, more about what you do, get in touch with you, where would they go? So the best place is the Ministry of Eco Education org. It's our website. Uh, and yeah, and it may be even when this video comes out, they might just be able to access and sign up through that website. OK, well, thanks a lot, Paul. That's really interesting. And and you clearly have very ambitious plans and you've done a lot already. And I mean, you're one of many organisations working with schools and um, schools certainly need it. And I can I can see from what we've done here locally, many, many schools are very enthusiastic now to be involved. They want to to engage with the climate change agenda and get it very much integrated into their curriculum. So thank you for what you're doing and thank you for for doing this interview today. And uh, we'll end this interview now. Thank mm-hmm. you.